verse. All right. Let's go to the last one. Let's hear the conclusion of this whole matter. Let's go to Ecclesiastes, the 12th chapter. This is the conclusion of this whole matter, brothers and sisters. This is the bottom line right here. Ecclesiastes 12, and we're going to pick it up at verse 13. Ecclesiastes 12, and we're going to read 13 and 14. And God is not playing, because if he's going to give you eternal life, you're going to earn this. You know, ain't nobody scared today because ain't nothing really bad happened. But the book talks about resisting under blood. We have not done that yet. As bad as it is out here with these pestilence and all that, you have not resisted under blood yet. It's going to get worse. So the best thing for us to do is just keep these commandments and let the band play on. Go ahead and read. Verse 13, what does it say? Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Uh huh. Fear God and keep his commandments. Go ahead. For this is the whole duty of man. This is man's whole duty to keep the commandments. Go ahead and read, brother. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Ain't that something? In Revelation 22, it says, I mean, in Revelation 20, it says, the Lord going to judge every man and every woman according to his works. That's why you got to just do that simple thing by doing the best you can by keeping the commandments. Let's go to 2 Corinthians, the uh, fifth chapter, because we are not under that old covenant anymore. Now, let's make that clear. We are not under the old covenant anymore. When Jesus died and shed his blood and the veil of the temple ripped from top to bottom, that signified that we are not under the blood of bulls and goats anymore. A lot of them priestly laws we don't keep anymore because we got a new high priest. He came and walked on the earth for three and a half years, and then he went on back home. He left the blueprint for salvation, but ain't nobody paying attention. But I'm going to show you who's trying to save you and whose plan this was. Pick it up at verse 17. What does it say, brother? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Now, if any of y'all be in Christ, you are a new creature. When you were baptized, you, that all you was left in that water. You should be a new creature. You should talk different. You should walk different. You should treat your family different. Brothers, you should treat your wives different. You are a new creature. Go ahead and read, brother. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Go ahead. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Everybody's reading that, right? All things are of God who have reconciled you to himself by Jesus Christ. It is the Father that's trying to save you. It is his plan that Jesus implemented. He is reconciled. He is recovering you through Jesus now. Go ahead and read. And have given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And that's the ministry we are under now. We are the, under the ministry of recovery, of reconciliation. Continue to read. What does it say? To wit. That God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. He said it again. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Go ahead and read. Not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Go ahead. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Yes. As though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. You see what he said? Y'all be reconciled to God. Keep the commandments. The book tell you in John 10, Jesus is the door. You got to go through Jesus, which will reconcile you to the Father. See, we have forgotten the program. We have forgotten it. Brothers and sisters, my name is Brother Greg. I'll be your teacher for today's lesson. And the title of the lesson is the Day of Atonement. This is the season for it. It's coming up. The memorial blowing of the trumpets is next. And then this day is coming up, the Day of Atonement. This is the day that the Lord atoned the sins to the Father. His blood had to be uh, uh, shed and had to be accepted by God so we could be ex back accepted into the God family. Y'all understand? This is a process that he did and he planned. Those high days in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, is set up to show you God's plan. We started out, believe it or not, these are the feasts of the Lord. We're going to read that, but we started out with the weekly Sabbath. Then we turned around and went to the Passover. 
Why feast of the Lord? Because you are being fed today. You are fed every Sabbath day. You work six days, so you come here so we can feed you. So we can lift, so God, I don't say we, but so God can lift some of the burdens off of you. That's why you do it every single week. Because he is trying to, he knows this is a tough captivity. And he knows this is a tough world. So he is trying to help you get this, get this off of you. So, the, so, the, so this is the Day of Atonement. I put this on the board because we're going to read this. This is a memorial. Why is it a memorial? Because it's always on the 10th day of the seventh month. Whenever he gives you a date like the Passover, it's on the 14th day of the first month, it is a memorial. It is a holy convocation. That means you're supposed to come to class. It is a high Sabbath day. It's higher than the regular Sabbath because this is a Sabbath that you, or this particular Sabbath is when you afflict your soul. We're going to go through that as the lesson progress. Afflicting your soul means fasting. No food, no water. That is what the atonement is all about. This is a time of praying, of uh, uh, getting yourself closer to the Lord. This is what this is all about. It is a time of praying, a time of finding that inner strength in you to serve your God, and hopefully he'll save you at the time appointed. So now we're going to start off in St. John 3, and we're going to pick it up at verse 16. St. John 3, we're going to pick this up at verse 16. St. John 3, and we're going to pick this up at verse 16. Because like we read earlier, that, you know, God is, uh, uh, is in Christ. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Now he's going to tell you how much he loved the world here. 3 and verse 16. John, Gospel of John. 3 and verse 16. What does it say, brother? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And that's a fact. He said, whoso, see, I, I'd like to make that point, Dom. It say, whosoever believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, we was listening to this school thing that he was listening to this morning. All they talking about is only certain people can be saved. That is nonsense. It say, don't, what does whosoever mean, y'all? Anybody don't. Whosoever. And that is what the world is going to find out down the road. The Lord is no respecter of persons, but he will cut you off if you become a respecter of persons. What verse are you? Verse 17. Continue to read. For God sent not his son into the world. Now he was sent into the world. Go ahead. To condemn the world, uh -huh. but that the world through him might be saved. Read that again for me. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's good. Let's go to Romans, the uh, fifth chapter, Romans 5. He sent him into the world, not to condemn it, but through him that, that you might be saved, brothers and sisters. That's why you got to read your Bible for yourself. I used to go to a Sunday church, and one time I was, he, he had called out the scripture. I had read the scripture but then I kept reading while I was in the church. Do you know the deacons came, had me come to the office after the church and re reprimanded me for reading the Bible? They literally reprimanded me for reading the Bible while he was up there lying. I mean, I mean preaching. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what happened to me. We're going to read one verse here. Romans 5, and we're going to pick this up at verse 12. Romans 5, we're going to pick this up. At verse 12, because this is what happened. This is what happened. We can go back, you know, we're not going to do it, but we can go back to uh, uh, Genesis and, and read this. The reason Adam is in trouble is because Eve came out of Adam. Adam was really the first woman, but Eve came out of Adam. So whatever happened with her, Adam was responsible. That's why, that's why he told Adam, well, if you do this, death going to fall on you. He didn't tell the woman that. He gave her pain and childbearing and all that. But he didn't tell her what he told Adam. That's why it reads like this. Read verse 12. What does it say? Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, 
and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Some have sinned. All have sinned. What that? Y'all read that too? All have sinned. And see, that's why we are in a fight for our lives. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Man sinned, a man had to remove sin. Animals did what they were supposed to do. They were flesh and blood. The Lord allowed us to use the animal as a sin offering. But everybody, from Adam all the way to today, everybody in that graveyard over there that died in the Lord, everybody has to be covered in the blood of Jesus. Everybody. That blood is retroactive. It goes backwards and it goes forward. Pick it up uh, at verse 21. Pick it up at verse 21. 1 Corinthians 15, and we're going to have the brother pick it up at verse 21. The book is not hard to be understood. It's just like the Lord said, how can you hear without a preacher? And how can a preacher preach to you unless he was sent? you got to be able to rightfully divide the scripture to paint a picture of what's going on. Verse 21, what does it say, brother? For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. By man came death, Adam, and also by man came the resurrection of the dead, which is Jesus. Go ahead and read, brother. For for as in Adam all die. He said it again. As in Adam all die. He is the father of us all. Go ahead and read. Even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now, let's go to uh, St. John the 11th chapter together. St. John the 11th chapter. Because this man knew that, that the Lord had to come and die for the sins of the people. He knew it. So he spoke on it. St. John 11, and we're going to pick this up at verse 46. St. John 11, and we're going to pick it up at verse 46. Do what now? St. John 11 and verse 46. If I'm going too fast, just throw your hand up. That's all. Just throw your hand up. I don't mind slowing it down. Sure. We had we got the head past the headmaster come up here and say, slow it down. <laughs> okay. St. John, chapter 11, verse 46. Okay. Slow it down, G. All right. Verse 46. What did it say, Dom? But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Go ahead. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council and said, what do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. Mm -hmm. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. So they, they scared that the Romans was going to take away their stuff because Jesus was healing the sick. And he was raising the dead and all of that. Go ahead and read, brother. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, mm -hmm. Ye know nothing at all, Go ahead. nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, Go ahead. and that the whole nation perish, and that the whole nation perish not. Uh -huh. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus, Jesus should die for that nation. Go ahead. And not for that nation only, only uh -huh. but all but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. You see that? So this man knew that somebody had to die for the sins of the people. Not only did he know that, he knew that it had to be Jesus that was going to die for the sins of the people. So now, let's go to St. John, the uh, first chapter. And I'm going to step back from my book for a second. St. John, chapter 1. And we're going to pick this up at verse 29. St. John, chapter 1. We're going to pick this up at verse 29. I probably should count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. St. John, chapter 1, verse 29. I guess that's, a, that's that spirit they talk about. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Okay? Verse 29. 1, in verse 29 to get and look if I go too fast just throw your hand up verse 29 go ahead and read the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith 
Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, that's, that's important. Behold, the Lamb of God that is taking away the sins of the world. Now, this Lamb had to suffer some. Now, can you imagine he was God that manifested in the flesh, but he came in the flesh, and they put crowns of thorns on his head. They spit in his face. They took his robe off and put some purple robe on him. They humiliated him, but he took it because he knew that he had to die for the sins of the people. And when I talk to people on the street, I ask them, do they believe this? Do you believe the report that the Lord left? Some do, some don't. But I ask that question. Let's go to Isaiah 57. Isaiah 57. And we're going to pick this up at verse 1. Because even the Lord asked, and this is where I got it from, even the Lord asked, who going to believe our report? 53. 53. I mean, Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Who shall believe our report? What was that? Who shall believe our report? And that is a good question. And then it's going to say, who shall the arm of the Lord be revealed? Because Jesus is the arm of the Lord, brothers and sisters. Make no mistake about that. He is the arm of the Lord. In other places, I can show you that as well. Isaiah 53, we're going to start at verse 1. Isaiah 53 and verse 1, brothers and sisters. What does it say, Brother Dodd? Who hath believed our report? Yes. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? See, he's the right arm. He is the arm of the Lord. Who going to believe our report? And whom shall the arm of the Lord be revealed? Go ahead and read, brother. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant mm -hmm. and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So he didn't come looking like Denzel Washington, no pretty boy. He came to do a job. He said there was no beauty in him and all of that. But he didn't come to be pretty and had a woman swooning all over it. Like that. He came to do his job. Verse 3. Now look how they, everybody say they love him today, but look what the books say. Go ahead and read. He is despised and rejected of uh, men. Uh huh. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Go ahead. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Go ahead. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Go ahead. But he was wounded for our transgressions. See, now he, somebody had to die for the sins of the people, like Caiaphas said, right? Mm -hmm. He said he was wounded for our transgressions. It don't say he was wounded just for Israel. He was wounded for our transgressions. Whosoever will let him come. Continue to read. What does it say, brother? He was bruised for our iniquities. Oh, go ahead. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. With his stripes we are healed. Not Isaiah. No one else. With his stripes. Remember, the Father sent him to reconcile the world back to the Father. Continue to read, brother. What verse are you? Verse 6. Continue. All we like sheep have gone astray. Uh huh. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Go ahead, brother. He was oppressed, and he, aff and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before she her shears is dumb. Can you imagine being accused, knowing that you didn't do anything, keep your mouth shut? He didn't whimper. He didn't go out like no sissy. He took it like a man. He could have backed out at any time, but he was not going to back out. He did this, brothers and sisters, for you. He was afflicted for you. He opened not a, his mouth. He was a lamb brought to the slaughter. Did you finish seven? I'm at the end of seven. Could, read seven again. What does it say? He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not, not his, his mouth. mouth. Ain't that something? Skip down to verse 10 for me and read verse 10. What does it say? Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Now look what it said. It made his soul, 
an offering for sin. But when somebody died, they always say the soul flew out the body. But he was a sin offering. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? He was a sin offering. He was offered to God for our sins. That's what we just read about. He was offered to God. And it said, when he shall make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, prolong his days, and so on and so forth, brothers and sisters. He did this for you. He had to be offered. He was without blemish. And I'm going to show you that in a, little, in a little bit. Our Lord was a sin offering. He was the book called his soul, the body. Now let's take a quick look at that. Let's go to Hebrews, the 10th chapter together. Hebrews, the 10th chapter. And I'm going to show you the soul is the body. Not something, an entity in the body that you can't see. That flies out. Two seconds after you pass on, that you can't see. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. He's going to read verses 9 and 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And, and Brother Dom, I'm going to read verses 9 and 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Verses 9 and 10. Everybody got it? Go ahead and read, brother. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. Uh -huh. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. The first covenant was taken away, and he established the second one. Go ahead and read. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So everybody can see the body is the soul. Y'all see that? Everybody see that? The soul, he said... He said, uh, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once and for all. Let's go to Leviticus, the fourth chapter, so I can show you what a sin offering is, what it does, how it implies to you yesterday, but so you can understand it today. Because this is very important. Leviticus, the fourth chapter. I'm glad he slowed me down because now I can be cool about it. Leviticus, the fourth chapter. Okay? I can do that Denzel Washington voice. Leviticus. And I'm glad he did that too because I guess the spirit had me rolling up here. The fourth chapter. Now this is about a sin offering. Now this bullock is a sin offering. Even the high priest had to do this if he uh, sinned out of ignorance. So Leviticus, what did I say? Four chapter. Chapter 4, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Leviticus, for those that's taking notes, Leviticus 4, we're going to start off with 1 through 6. Leviticus chapter 4, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Now pay attention. This is where sin is the transgression of the law originated from. Go ahead and read, brother, what it say. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, uh -huh. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord, concerning things which ought not to be done, and shall do against any of them. Everybody see that? Ain't that clear? Mm -hmm. If you sin out of ignorance against the commandments of the Lord. Back to the commandments, because that's what it's all about. That is what you're going to be judged on. If you sin out of ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning uh, the thing which ought not to be done and shall do against any of them. What does it say? Verse 3. If the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people, then let him bring for his sin, which he hath sinned, a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for a sin offering. Go ahead. And he shall bring the bullock unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord and shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head and kill the bullock before the Lord. See, this bullock represent the Lord because they killed him before the Lord. The, the, the priest represented Jesus. Everything represents the Lord in this old book. All these clean offerings, all these pre this priesthood, Moses, Aaron, all of this represented the Lord as your high priest today. That's why you pray to the Father in Jesus' name. Do not pray directly to, to the Son because that ain't going to work. He ain't going to hear your prayer. Jesus told you, when you pray, pray ye our Father which art in heaven. That's what he told you to do. What verse are you? 
Verse 5. Continue. And the priest that is anointed shall take of the bullock's blood and bring it to the t tabernacle of the congregation. Mm -hmm. And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle of the blood seven times before the, the Lord. The Lord gave man seven days. So he going to sprinkle the blood seven times before the Lord, which is the 7,000 years that he gave man to cover every generation of man and woman. So he's going to sprinkle the blood. Now, keep your mind on the blood because we're going to look at that again. Go ahead and refinish. Did you finish that verse? The last part of six. Go ahead. Before the veil of the sanctuary. Now, skip down to verse 12, verse 12, and read verse 12 because they took Jesus outside the camp. They killed him outside the camp. The book tells you that you got to come outside the camp, which means you got to forget about all the traditions that you've ever been involved with. You know, like Sunday worship, Pastor anniversary, Easter, Christmas. All these are traditions of men. So you got to come outside the norm of the traditions of men. Even you got to come outside the camp. Read that verse, start that verse over again, verse 12. Even the whole bullock shall he carry forth without Out the, the camp, camp unto a clean place where the ashes are poured out and burn him on the wood with fire. Where the ashes are poured out shall he be burned. Skip down to verse 15. Now look at the elders. The elders put the Romans up to this. If you go back and read in the Gospels, the elders put uh, uh, Pilate and them up to kill Jesus. They wanted to let him go. He washed his hands of this. But they said, no, no. You got to kill Jesus. Let Barabbas go. Let his blood be on us and our children. And his blood is on us and our children. Continue to read verse 15. What does it say? And the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands upon the head of the bullock before the Lord. Uh -huh. And the bullock shall be killed before the Lord. Now, all this process. Let's see what the outcome of the process is. Verse 20. What does it say, brother? And he shall do with the bullock as he did with the bullock for a sin offering. So shall he do with this. Uh huh. And the priest shall make an atonement for them, and it shall be forgiven them. See, that's how you got your sin forgiven back in the day under that old covenant. You had to go through all those changes to get your sins forgiven. That is how you had to do that. So now, let's move on. Let's go to, uh, let's go to Hebrews, the 8th chapter. Hebrews, the 8th chapter. Hebrews 8. Hebrews 13, y'all. Hebrews 13. That's where I want to go. Because I want to show you even you got to come outside the camp. Hebrews 13, and we're going to pick it up at verse 11. We're going to read 11 through 13 of those that's taking notes. And then after that, we're going to go to Exodus 12. Hebrews 13 and verse 11. Hebrews 13 and verse 11. Hebrews 13 and verse 11. What does it say? For the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin uh -huh. are burned without the camp. See, everything is outside the camp. Go ahead and read. Wherefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered, suffered without the gate. Go ahead. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. There you go. Because you got to come outside of this world. You in the world, but you're not of this world. So you got to come outside of the norms and the traditions of this world. You got to come outside. Let's go to uh, uh, Exodus the 12th chapter. Exodus 12. You got to come outside the camp. All this traditional teaching. You know, like not one that always get me is the baptizing of babies. Why would you baptize a baby? They call it christening. Why would you do that? What do you baptize for the remission of? So what, what, what sin does a child have, a baby have? See, we, do, we, we follow the Christianity of the Roman Catholic Church, and people don't, they, they mistaken us for following that Christianity. But we, follow, we are called Christians because we follow Christ, period. The Christ of this Bible, not, not that Christ of the Roman Catholic Church or the Protestants. We are following 
Christ. But everybody want to say we are part of that Roman Catholic tradition, but we are not. All you got to do is watch us, see what we do, what feast we keep. You know, we keep. All they got to do is just take a good look at you. You ain't got to say nothing. If they walk around and follow you, they should be able to see that you are a new creature. Exodus 12, we're going to start at verse 1. We're going to skip to 3. Exodus 12, we're going to start at verse 1. Remember the blood now, because this blood is very, very important. Exodus chapter uh, uh, 12, and we're going to pick it up at verse 1, then he's going to skip to 3. What does it say? And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying. Now, always, notice that, y'all, it always say the Lord spake. You know, everybody talking about Moses' law, the laws of Moses. It don't look like the laws of Moses to me. It don't look like the laws of Moses to y'all. He always, the Lord spake unto Moses, said. Moses ain't got no rap. One time, one time Moses, I mean, the Lord got at Moses for striking the rock and then saying, hey, uh, uh, me and Aaron gave y'all water, and the Lord told him he could not go into the promised land. Then Moses going to sneak back on the down low and go and say, Lord, let me holler at you about this one more time. The Lord told him, don't even bring that up to me no more. It is what it is. You will not go into the promised land. So I don't know why people are saying the laws of Moses. Moses ain't got no laws. The Lord run this thing completely. Verse 3, what does it say, brother? Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall make to them every shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, uh -huh. a lamb for an house. Go ahead. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your account for the lamb. Mm -hmm. Your lamb shall be without blemish. So this lamb that's going to be offered to God had to be without sin. Without blemish. Go ahead and read. A male of the first year. Go ahead. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goat. And see, I like, I like to kind of look at this. In verse 3, it says, speak to all the congregation of Israel. Do we say that in y'all's book? Mm -hmm. So now, I'm going to deviate for one second. Let's go over to, to uh, verse 47 and 48. I want to show you God has always included everybody. Always. Just, not just Israel, the, the stranger that sojourned with Israel is included. They have the right to the tree of life, just like Israel did. Read 47 and 48, then we're going to go back. What, what does it say, Brother Don? All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. And when a stranger shall so sojourn with thee and will keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. Uh-huh. And then let him come near and keep it. Go ahead. And he shall be as one that is born in the land. Uh huh. For no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. Go ahead. One law shall be to him that is homeborn and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. Sojourn, live among you, be a part of this thing. I, I got that in the lesson, but I wanted you to see that because he says, speak to all the congregation. We are, all, we, we are all part of the oneness, of the one body. And I can't stress that because that's all we heard about coming up here on this schoolhouse or whatever they call it that they be on. This is, this is one salvation. And the world going to find out when that man is seeing pop his head up because he ain't taking no prisoners. That great tribulation is going to wash the garbage out of people's minds. Or you're going to end up taking the mark and the Lord is going to kill you on the way down, even before his feet hit the ground. This is, this is serious here. What do we leave off at? Verse 5? Verse 6. We're going to start at verse 5 again. Go ahead and read. Your lamb shall be without blemish a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Go ahead. And ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Y'all see that? So that's what happened when the elders, the elders put the Romans up to kill it. So that represented the assembly of the congregation of Israel. So now that is exactly what happened. Verse 7, what does it say? And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. So now you had to take the blood and strike it on the door post. Skip down 
to verse 13 and read 13 and 14 for them. Now remember, he told you on the, on the 14th day of the first month, that makes it what? It makes it a memorial. You do this every year, once a year. This Passover is not every week like this Catholic church does it or some of these Sunday Christians of the fourth Sunday or the first Sunday. We have been bamboozled. We, we are still in darkness. Not, not you guys here, but the people in the world. Because they're doing something totally contrary to God. What verse are you? Verse 13. Go ahead and read. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. Uh-huh. And when I see the blood. He, when, I, when he said, when I see the blood, what are you going to do? I will pass over you. Go ahead. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Go ahead, brother. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. Uh -huh. And ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. See, you do this every year and we feed you. Every year, we give you that spiritual food, and then we take the blood and the wine so you don't forget about what the Lord did for you. Skip down. We read verse 49, 47 through 49, so read verse 11 for them. Whose feast is this? Verse 11, what does it say? And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Ye shall eat it in haste. Uh -huh. It is the Lord's Passover. It is the Lord's, but not the Jews. Not the Israel of God's. It is the Lord's Passover. You know how they always say that? You know, it's the Jews' Passover. They don't even believe in Jesus. You know why? Because they don't give you the bread and the wine. They give you a shank bone and, and some flowers and stuff to eat. You know what I'm saying? On a little plate. They don't believe in Jesus, period. And that's a shame. That is a shame. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter. Let's Let's, let's see who this Passover is. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Brother Bill ain't got to come back up here because I got it now. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You know. My bad, Brother Bill. I'm going to slow it down. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to read 6 and 7, you know, so uh, for those that's taking notes. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Go ahead and read. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? See, that's why the Feast of Unleavened Bread, he's trying to get you for the seven days God gave man to eat unleavened bread, and to remind you to walk sin free. The plan of God is in your face. Ain't nobody paying attention. Preachers don't read the old book, and then we got Israelites don't read the new book. But the plan of God is in your face. What verse are you? Verse 7. Go ahead and read. Purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump. He said purge out that old, that old sin that you may be a new lump. A little leaven, a little sin, going to continue to cause you to sin. Continue to read, brother. What else does it say? As ye are unleavened. Read the seven, top, top of seven again. Go ahead. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a, a new lump. A new lump. Mm -hmm. As ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Christ, now everybody in this room know who the Passover is. Mm -hmm. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Let's go to 1 John in the back of your Bible. In the back. 1 John chapter 1. We're going to read verse 7 for those that's taking notes. And then we're going to skip to verse 9. 1 John. I went back over that, that, atop, I mean, that uh, tribulation lesson that I do. When I, when I get a chance, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to show you even more stuff that's going to take place. Protect yourselves, brothers and sisters. Protect your mind, which is your heart. Protect yourself because you're going to need to. This is going to be a terrible time. And as I said in the outset, we have not resisted under blood yet. That is coming. 1 John chapter 1, and we're going to read verse 7 first. And Jesus is the light of the world. The light illuminates. Go ahead and read. 
But if we but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, yes. we have fellowship one with another. Uh -huh. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. See, that's what the blood does. It cleanses us. Skip down to verse uh, 9 and read verse 9. What does it say, Brother Don? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Y'all see that? You know, you don't have to confess your sins to me or to nobody else. You, you do that in your closet, and you go to the Lord with your sin. And, it, and he will forgive you, because that's why Jesus is your advocate. He will forgive you. That's how important his blood is. It cleanses you from everything. Let's go to Leviticus, the 17th chapter. Leviticus 17. You see how I'm going back and forth? old and new because you need the law and the testimony you need them both to paint this picture for you can understand what's going on the law and the testimony if you speak not according to this word there's no light in you we're going to read one verse Leviticus 17 now this is why the blood is important Leviticus 17 now, we had the blood of bulls and of goats. We had that. The Lord just did that until the Lord Jesus could get here, until he could manifest in the flesh. So he allowed you to use the blood of animals, but he told you that the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. So it was just a loner until the Lord can come. And if you die in the Lord and you die righteous, you're going to get a righteous person's reward. I can guarantee you that because the Lord said it and I believe it. First, I mean, uh, Leviticus 17, and we're going to read one verse, verse 11. Now, this is so true. If anybody work in the hospital, you know this. You have all kind of oxygen and all kind of stuff in your blood. Now, look what the Lord said here. Verse 11. What did he say, Don? For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Uh-huh. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your soul. For your what? For your soul to make an atonement for your soul so you have to have the blood to make an atonement for your soul go ahead and read for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul it's the blood brothers and sisters that's why he said when i see the blood of that lamb i will pass over you then not just pass over you pass over your sins brothers and sisters that is what the lord is talking about he said i will pass over you now let's go to first peter first peter First Peter. He said, I'm going to pass over you if you do this right. Pay, you know, when you get baptized, I don't know how many of y'all has got baptized, but when you come into this truth, you need to be baptized. Symbolically, in the old book, the book say that Israel was back, and the stranger that served John, they was baptized unto Moses. Baptized unto the intercessor. So you have to be baptized unto the intercessor today. 1 Peter chapter 1. And we're going to pick this up at verse 18. For those that's taking notes, verse 18 through 20. Verses 18 through 20. See, you can't be redeemed with no money and all of that. The Lord is going to show you what's going to redeem you. Verse 18, what does it say, brother? For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold. Yes. From your vain conversation received by traditions from your father. See, you can't, be, you can't buy your way into this. I can show you in the, in the, in the uh, tribulation scripture, you can, be, you can be a trillionaire. If you ain't got that mark, you can't buy a hot dog. You can't buy anything. You can't buy nor sell. If you don't have the mark of the beast, which means... He owned you or you belong to him. Because when Satan fell with them angels and they had that war in heaven, the Bible said those angels belong to Satan. You take Satan's mark, you belong to him. Verse 18, did you start at verse 18? Did you finish it? Yes, verse go, 19. Go ahead and read. But with the precious blood of Christ. That's what redeemed you. The, pl the precious blood of Christ, go ahead. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Go ahead. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Y'all see that? He was ordained before the foundation of the world. That's why Don brought up a scripture earlier about 
Isaiah 57 and 15. It says, thus says the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity whose name is holy. Then Jesus turned around and said, I dwell with him. Isaiah can't dwell in eternity. He was born of a woman. He said, I dwell with him. That is of a humble and contrite spirit or heart or something like that it says. This is, this is something that you need to understand. You got two members of the Godhead. One came, one sent the other one. Jesus sent Jehovah in his name to save you. Period. And this is what we have to understand. This is what makes us stronger. He said, who verily was ordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last days for you. He did all of this for you. Let's go to 1 John in the back of your book. 1 John chapter 2. And now he's back home. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. Waiting to take your prayer to the Father. It all ties together. It all ties together. The Father sent him to reconcile the world. Now, he was your high priest. That's why he was Melchizedek in the very beginning. He showed you his priesthood. So now he loaned it out to Moses and Aaron, and now he's back home, and he is uh, 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 a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, y'all. This, he, he's laying it out for you, but now, you know, like when you get in trouble, let's say you got 250 tickets, and you, gotta, and you, you know you need a lawyer or an advocate. So that's what the Jesus is right now. He is your advocate. He is your lawyer. Pick it up at verse 1. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. Right? Yep. Go ahead and read. My little children. My little children, he says. Go ahead. These things write I unto you, that ye sin not. Uh-huh. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, he is your lawyer, your attorney now. Jesus Christ the righteous. He is your advocate. Go ahead and read. And he is the propitiation for our sins. That word propitiation means atonement. He is the atonement for your sin. Go ahead and read, brother. And not for ours only, uh -huh. but also for the sins of the whole world. Ain't that something for the sins of everybody? It didn't say just for the sins of Israel, did it? Nope. For the sins of the whole world, the book say. Go ahead and read, brother. You want me to skip? Skip down to verse 6. Skip down to verse 6. What does it say? He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk even as he walked. So now you got to walk. That's what makes you a Christian. To walk, you got to walk even as the Lord walked. Let's go back to Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, and we're going to pick this up at verse 1. Leviticus 23 and verse 1. These are the feasts of the Lord, not the feast of the Jews. I talked to a brother that he... He's, uh, he go to a class called the KOG. I've been knowing this dude forever. And he's just trying to sell me on that, that salvation is only for Israel because the Lord put Israel in captivity. But when I read to him that 28th chapter of Deuteronomy and other places, then now he got a problem with me now. I just read it now. Why has he got a problem with me? I just read why. We went into captivity. Why we are treated so harshly. You know how many chances, if you'd read your book, you know how many chances God gave you? He even sent judges, and after the, after the judge came on the set and got you out of trouble, then you turned right around and went back to your folly, went, went back to sinning against God. Now think about that. You, you, didn't, you didn't force the creator off the earth that he created for all of mankind. Imagine, imagine what I'm saying to you. Then you got some of us walking around always grumpy. Cannot see the Lord in the weather, in the, in the days, in the trees. You ever notice that in the wintertime everything die? But then in, a, then in the spring and the summer everything comes back to life. You ever pay attention to that? He is showing you the resurrection in your face during the season. But you're not paying no attention to it. The one that deserved the glory, you need to give it to him. Because he's showing you the death and the resurrection all the time. What about when it gets dark 
and it starts the day, and then it becomes light. Same thing. The Lord is showing you the outcome of what you're working for. But we cannot see it. Verses 1 and 2, what does it say? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Uh Uh-oh, the Lord giving Moses even more instructions. What did he say? Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them concerning the feast of the Lord, Uh which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. So this day of atonement is a holy convocation. It is a gathering. The church is supposed to gather on the day of atonement, on the weekly Sabbath, on the Passover, on the Feast of Unleavened Bread, on Pentecost, on the memorial blowing of the trumpets. We are supposed to gather as a one body. This is not the Israel of God's function. The Israel of God is following Jesus. That's what we do. That's what I do. I'm following Jesus because that's where my salvation lies. What verse are you? That was the end of verse 2. Verse 2? Yep. Verse 4. Skip down to verse 4. What does it say? These are the feasts of the Lord. Again, these are the feasts of the Lord. Go ahead and read. Even holy convocations, uh-huh. which ye shall proclaim in their season. Go ahead. And the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. Even the Passover is the feast of the Lord. Go ahead and read. What verse are you now? That was the end of verse 5. Skip down to verse 9 and pick it up at verse 9. Now he's going to go into the sheaf of the first fruits. Jesus is the sheaf of the first fruits. Actually, he is the first of the first fruits because the book called you the first fruits. Go ahead and read verse 9. What does it say? And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Uh Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof. Now you're going to reap the harvest thereof. Now, brothers and sisters, unleavened bread is a harvest feast. Pentecost is a harvest feast. Tabernacle. It's the feast at the end of the year. We're supposed to feast for seven days, and then on the eighth day is a holy convocation. So now, the Lord is not harvesting crops. He's harvesting people. That's why it's called the end gathering. He is harvesting people. He is trying to give you the salvation that if you work for it, that you deserve. Jesus said, when I come, then we read, he said, my reward is with me. Didn't he say that? So now, what verse are you, Dom? Middle of 10. Go ahead and read. Then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits now of Jesus your harvest. Now, Jesus represents that sheaf of the first fruits. Go ahead. Of your harvest uh-huh. unto the priest. Go ahead. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord. Now, he gonna wave, the priest going to wave the sheaf before the Lord. Go ahead. To be accepted for you. To be accepted for who? You. For you. You see that? This is all about you. He just go about a roundabout way to paint the picture for you. This old book and this new book goes together like like a hand in a glove. He is trying to explain to you how he's going to save you. This sheaf is accepted for you when, brother? On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Go ahead. And ye shall offer that day when ye wave the sheaf, and he land without blemish of the first year, for a burnt offering unto the Lord. Ain't that something? So now you got to wave this sheaf before the Lord, and he's going to offer a he lamb without blemish before the Lord. What verse are you now? That was the end of 12. Verse 14, what does it say? And ye shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the self... Look what that say. Ye shall... Uh, it say ye shall eat neither. You can't eat nothing while this sheaf is being waved. You say you shall eat, and that's important, so when we get over to John 20, because when Jesus, when Mary Magdalene walked up on him, he told her, don't touch me. Touch me not, because he represented, he was represented of this sheep. Nothing could be eaten, nothing could be touched. Do 14 again, Brother Don, what does it say? And ye shall eat neither bread, nor parched corn, nor green ears until the selfsame day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. Mm-hmm. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. Ain't that some? It shall be a statue forever. When they harvest it, you couldn't do nothing. See, the sheaf represent the very, very best of the crops. So you're going to take that which represents Jesus, and you're going to thank God. You're going to wave it before the Lord. Can't nobody sit up here and have no meal or nothing like that until this sheaf was waved on the morrow after the Sabbath, which was on a Sunday. 
See, he's pointing to what we're about to read now. Let's go to St. John, the 20th chapter. St. John 20. See, the Lord is trying to show you the way. He is the light of the world. He is trying to show you how to get salvation. So just like the people didn't know him when he came in the flesh, but some brothers knew him because they watched him. They knew what he was supposed to do by reading prophecy. You're going to know him too. St. John, chapter 1. I mean, chapter 20, I'm sorry. Chapter 20. And we're going to pick this up at verse 1. He's going to read 1 through 4 for those that's taking notes. St. John, chapter 20, verses 1 through 4. We're going to start off with that. What does it say, my brother? The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, uh -huh. unto the sepulcher, and see at the stone taken away from the sepulcher. So when she got there, the stone was removed. She looked in there. He was gone. Go ahead and read. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved uh -huh. and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Go ahead. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. Now skip down to verse 11. So now... He said he was out, he was gone with nothing in the tomb. You know, that kills that the soul flew out the body because all of him was gone when she looked in there. Verse 11, what does it say? But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and see two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Where his body had lain. He was gone. Go ahead and read. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Go ahead. And when she had thus, and when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Now she was talking to the Lord that they had been around all this time, but he had resurrected. So I guess he had the cloaking device on, you know, like in Star Wars, you can't see him. So now he had the cloaking device on, verse 15, what did he say after that? Go ahead. Jesus saith unto her. What did he say? Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Uh-huh. She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Go ahead, brother. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. Now that's the way he called her, and she recognized him. Mary, go ahead and read. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Go ahead. Jesus saith unto her, Touch, touch me, me not. not. So she could, he could not be touched. He represented that sheaf. Touch me not. Go ahead and read. For I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your, your father, father. Uh -huh. and to my God and your God. Ain't that something? God has a God. He told you, he said, I have, I have ascended to my father and your father and unto my God and your God. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. These two lived in eternity. They were not created. They were the creators. Let's go to Leviticus, the 23rd chapter now. Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. I'm just painting you this picture. This day of atonement is super important. All, all we going all we dealing with is the death and the resurrection of Jesus. But God is gonna give you examples of this. Then Paul in Romans gonna give you an example, the same example but the shorter version. All this is is we are looking at why he died. See, the Passover was the lamb that was offered, but the atonement was why he died, what he did for you, why he did it for you. So now, uh, Leviticus 23, and we're going to pick it up at verse 26. Leviticus 23, and we're going to pick it up at verse 26. And for those who's taking notes, we're going to go from 26 to 32. Leviticus 23, we're going to start at verse 26. Go ahead and read. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, also on the tenth day of this seventh month, 
there shall be a day of atonement. Mm -hmm. It shall be an holy convocation unto you. Now that's going to be a holy convocation unto you on the tenth day of the seventh month. Go ahead. And ye shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Uh-huh. And ye shall do no work in that same day. Now, he, if it's all possible, like the, like the uh, weekly Sabbath, the Lord don't want you to do no work if it's possible. Don't go out there and get yourself fired and then come back and call Boo and tell him, I told you not to work. No. You, if you have to work and you can't get it off, you got to work. But then you try to, to afflict your soul during that time. But don't be saying I told you nothing, because I'm going to plead the fifth. Like Trump, like Trump now, they plead the fifth. So now, uh, what verse was that, brother? Uh, I'll start at 28 again. Go ahead, read 28. And ye shall do no work in that same, same day, day. Go ahead. For it is a day of atonement uh -huh. to make an atonement for you. Again, to make an atonement for you. Go ahead. Before the Lord, be your God. Before the Lord, your God. Go ahead and read. And whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted in that same day, uh -huh. he shall be cut off from his people. Go ahead. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, the same soul will I destroy from among his people. Y'all see how he said that? He said he going to cut you off from among his people. And then he said the same soul will I destroy from among the people. So this is a big thing that the Lord did for you. He came, he died, he shed his blood. They, they made him miserable. They did all kind of things to him in front of his family. And you, not gonna, can, you can't afflict your soul a little bit? What verse are you now? Verse 31. Continue. Ye shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations uh -huh. and all your dwellings. Go ahead. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest. Uh -huh. And ye shall afflict, afflict your, your soul, soul. Uh -huh. in the ninth day of the... In the ninth day of the month at even, from even unto even, shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. Now, everybody in this room know the ninth day at evening starts the tenth day. So that's why he said it like that. He clarified when a day starts. The ninth day at evening, when it gets dark, it starts the tenth day. Then he said from evening to evening. So that's a whole day. They, everybody's arguing about that. That makes no sense to me. The Lord tell you the day starts in the evening. The evening and the morning is the first day. Why is that so hard, brothers and sisters? I don't know. Matthew 6, Matthew 6. You know, everybody got their own thing they want to deal with. They don't want to be regimented. They don't, they don't want to be a part of the church where the church followed rules and regulations. That's what I like about the memorial blowing of the trumpets. The trumpets represent alarms, and it told you when to travel. If you was going, when one, one trumpet is blown, if you had to go north, you go north. The other trumpet was blown twice, you, would, you go uh, uh, east. You have to be able to follow instruction if you want to be saved. Matthew 6 and verse 16. Matthew 6 and verse 16. We're talking about afflicting your soul. And how do you afflict your soul? You fast. No food. No water. From, from the ninth day of the evening until the, the, the tenth day of the evening. You afflict your soul for 24 hours. That's all it is. Look what the Lord had written here. Matthew 6 and verse 16. Matthew 6 and verse 16. Brother, what does it say? Moreover, when ye fast. When you fast now. Go ahead. Be not as the hypocrites uh -huh. of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Uh -huh. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Ain't that something, y'all? Like I told this story the other day online. I was, we, was, we was in this supper club place that we had rented out, the class had rented out, and a dude walked in there, and he was, he was whining. He, he started whining when he hit the lobby. And he was whining about he was so hungry. I'm starving. Oh, I ain't going to make. Now, everybody in, the, everybody in there at the devil told me this hungry. He making it worse. Oh, Lord, I can't make it up. I said, man, go sit down somewhere. Nobody want to hear you whining. And we all, every, you can hear everybody's stomach in there growling. Rah, rah, rah. It almost uh, 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 drowned Bowie out. Everybody's belly was, 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 was growling. And he just all, oh, I thought he was going to lay down on the floor. Oh, I can't make it. Oh, 
man, I, I wanted to say something to him so bad. I just said, man, go on, sit your butt down somewhere. Don't, 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 don't say nothing else before we all jump on you, you know? <laughs> Matthew 6 and verse 16. Did you finish 16? Yeah, I finished 16. Go ahead and read some more, man. I mean, that's a true story. It's got wine all the way in. Then he, for some reason, he come up there where we were sitting at. He could have sat anywhere. He just, oh, bro, G, I can't make it. I, I can't make it. You got any oxygen? I, I can't make it. This dude was whining. Man, go sit your butt down somewhere. So now, verse 17, what, what does it say? But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head yes. and wash thy face. Yes. That thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy father, which is in secret. Uh-huh. And thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Ain't that some? He going to reward you openly. You doing this for a reason. Verse 33, this is what you're supposed to be seeking for. Verse 33, what does it say, brother? But seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first who? The kingdom, kingdom of, of God. Kingdom of God, y'all. Go ahead. And his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's what you do. You, you, you seek ye first the kingdom of God because you're going to suffer a little bit. He wants you to suffer a little bit. What is wrong with a little suffering? And fasting is good. I'm just not a faster type person. I wish I was. Because when you fast, that's like sitting up. Y'all ever watch? You know, I, I'm, I'm a big, my, my daughter, when she was little, she, she was a big cartoon fan. And she liked Batman. So whenever they needed Batman, they sent that bat signal up in the sky with that little light. Y'all know what I'm talking about? That brother over there know because he's laughing his head off. So, so they sit, they, you send the light up. So that's what fasting is. When you fast, you, you are showing the Lord you need help right away. You are giving up the basic necessities of this life. And you trying to get that prayer through. So that's why people fast for a week. Two weeks if they can and all that. You are trying to get God's attention. So that's why they fast like that. So now, Romans 8 and verse 16. Because you got you to gotta flick yourself a little bit. You, you got to suffer a little bit for him. He suffered for you to make, make this possible that you can be saved. Romans 8 and verse 16 and 17 for those that's taking notes. Romans 8. In verse 3, he just wants you to suffer a little bit. It ain't going to hurt you none. Everybody got it? Romans 8 and verse 16. What does it say, my brother? The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Yes. And if children, then heirs. Yes. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Look what it say. Joint heirs with Christ. You are an heir. You know, like if you are heir of a big fortune. You were part of that family, and you are an heir. You, you, you got something coming. You got that reward coming. You are an heir. Go ahead and read some more. If so be that we suffer with him. That we suffer with him, that we're going to do what? That we may be also glorified together. Like he was glorified, you're going to be glorified. Oh, you got, we do this once a year. First Timothy chapter 4. First Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. I probably should do all the high days one of these times and just do them all in one lesson. I think I can do that all in one lesson. Because all this points, like everything else, all this points to the Lord. All of it. He's trying to get your attention. 1 Timothy 4. And we're going to pick this up, and we're going to read verses 9 and 10. For those who's taking notes. 1 Timothy 4, we're going to pick it up at verse 9 and 10. Yep, 9 and 10. 1 Timothy 4, verses 9 and 10. Go ahead and read. What does it say, brother? This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Yes. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach. We both labor, because we are laboring for the salvation. We're working for it and suffer reproach. Go ahead and read, brother. Because we trust in the living God. Amen. Go who, ahead. Who is the Savior of all men. Some men. All men. I keep stressing that. We don't have a lot of people. What do I mean? We don't have a lot of nationalities in the class because of this brutal beatdown that some of you Israelites are doing to these people. 
Chinese, Japanese. You got Chinese Christians out here that believe the book. You got Puerto Ricans and Mexicans out here that believe the book. But they still caught under Catholicism. We are not trying to bring them in. But they're going to come. One day y'all going to look up. You don't have police around in the building trying to, trying to keep off because you can't have but a certain amount of people in the building. Them people going to come because they're going to hear something and it's going to draw them because it's going to be a time of trouble like no other time in human history. It's going to be a time of trouble and they're going to be trying to seek and what's going on and how to be saved in this wilderness, this place of safety. Everybody going to want to know about this place. So now, what verse are you? Uh, end of verse 10. Start at the top of 10 again. Read that for me again. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach. Yes. Because we trust in the living God. Yes. Who is the Savior of all men, uh -huh. especially of those that, that believe. Because that's the, that's the big thing. If you don't believe, you're not going to keep this day of atonement. You're not going to keep the Feast of Tabernacles if you don't believe. If you didn't believe that you lived at your address, you would never go there. See, you got to believe this. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John in the back of your book, chapter 4. 1 John in the back of your Bible. I remember, I remember uh, when I first got my hands on the Bible and... Uh, I, didn't, I couldn't find nothing, you know, in there. I, I, I mean, I really couldn't find it, and then I started reading. I was going to a Sunday church, but I started reading, as I told y'all earlier, in the, in the church. But when I first picked up the Bible, I thought Genesis was on the other side of Revelation. I just, I just didn't know any better. But once you get used to your book and you can navigate your book, everything gets easier to do. 1 John 4 and verse 9. He's going to read 9 and 10 for those that's taking notes. And then he's going to skip to verse 14. 9 and 10 and then verse 14. Look what the Lord said here that God did for us. Go ahead and read. In this was manifested the love of God toward us. The love of God toward us. Go ahead. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world. That we might live through him. Look at that. That we might live through him. Go ahead and read. Herein is love. Yes. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. us. Uh-huh. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Propitiation. The atonement for our sins. Somebody had to die for the sins of the people. No other way to get around that. Skip down to verse 14 and continue. What does it say, brother? And we have seen and do testify that yes. the Father sent the Son uh -huh. to be the Savior of the world. To be the Savior of who? Of the world. Of not just Israel? The entire world. Of the whole world, brothers and sisters. Let's go to Leviticus, the 16th chapter. Now, we're going to get into the example that God has left to you about this atonement. He's going to let you know by Aaron being a flesh and blood man on this earth, and Aaron was your high priest at the time, he going to let you know even Aaron had to have an atonement made for him. Then he's going to start talking about these two goats that he's going to use as an example. One goat represents the death of Jesus, and the other goat represents represent the resurrected Jesus. We're going to pick this up at verse 2. Lord, Leviticus 16, and we're going to pick this up at verse 2. Now pay close attention to this because you you're going to get Jesus all over this. And when we get to Romans, the 8th chapter, you, I mean Romans, the 5th uh, chapter, you're going to understand what you just read again because he's going to make this, this point here. Pick it up at verse 2. Verse 2, we're going to pick this up, Leviticus chapter 16, and he's going to pick it up at verse 2. What does it say, brother? And Le Leviticus chapter 16. And we're going to pick it up at verse 2. Verse 2. Verse 2. Verse 2. Go ahead and read. And the Lord said unto Moses. Again, the Lord spake unto Moses. What did he say? Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, uh -huh. which is upon the ark, that he died not. See, Moses really was your high priest back then. But then the Lord gave you a high priest that you can see, like Aaron. He had to wear the priestly garments, the little bonnet on his head. And when he came out the temple, he had to take them clothes off. 
So he was giving you something as you can see. So he warned Aaron, look, you can't go behind the veil anytime. Only on the day of atonement. Go ahead and read some more, brother. What does it say? For I will appear in the cloud. Did you read verse, did you read verse 3? I'm at the end of verse 2. Go ahead and read. For I will appear in the cloud upon the, the mercy, mercy seat. seat. Go ahead. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. See, we back to that sin offering. But he told him about this mercy seat but from the mercy seat where God talked to Moses from that mercy seat. Skip down to verse 5 and continue. What does it say? He shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering. Uh -huh. Now we back to this sin offering like the goat, we, I mean like the bullock we saw in Leviticus, the fourth chapter. So now these two uh, uh, kids of a goat for a sin offering, finish that. And one ram for a burnt offering. Go ahead and read. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. Yes. And make an atonement for himself yes. and for his house. So now by he being flesh and blood, he had to make an atonement for himself and for his family. Continue to read. What else does it say? And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Y'all ever notice when you're reading, you never read where they go inside the tabernacle of the congregation. It's always at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Go ahead and read. What else does it say? And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats. Now he's going to have to cast lots on the two goats. Go ahead. One lot for the Lord. And the other lot for the scapegoat. But they both for the Lord, because one he going to kill, and the other one he going to let go. The death and the resurrection of Jesus. Go ahead and finish that. What, what verse are you now? Verse 9. Continue. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell, and offer him for a sin offering. Yes. Now but he was offered. The one that, he, that, that the Lord's lot fell, he was offered for a sin offering. Continue to read. What does it say? But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat, shall be presented alive before the Lord. So that goat going to be presented alive before the Lord. That goat, that scapegoat, represent the resurrected Jesus. Do you all understand? You got one that they going to kill, because God ain't in the business of resurrecting no goats. So he killed one, and then he going to let one go. Uh, read verse 10 again. What does it say? But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat, shall be presented alive before the Lord uh -huh. to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. See, that wilderness right there represents he going to let him go in the wilderness, a, a land. See, that's what the wilderness means, a land uninhabited, where no man has ever been. So that represented Jesus went back to heaven. That's what he's talking about here. What verse are you, 11? Yeah, verse 11. Continue, brother. And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself uh -huh. and for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. So he had to make an atonement for himself and his family, to make an atonement for himself and for his house. So that's what Aaron had to do, because he was flesh and blood, and you had uh, a priest die all the time. They die out, they put another one in place. Verse 14, what does it say, my brother? And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Again, back to that sprinkling of the blood with his finger seven times. What else does it say? Go ahead. Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people. Now he going to kill that goat, that first goat that was, was uh, for a sin offering, that the Lord's lot fell for a sin offering for the people. Go ahead. And bring his blood within the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock uh -huh. and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. Now that goat that was for a sin offering that is for the people, didn't the Lord die for the sins of the people? Mm -hmm. So this is the examples that he's giving y'all here today. Go ahead and read some more. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place be yes. because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Now even the, even the tent of the tabernacle, he had to make an atonement for it. Go ahead and read. And because of their transgressions and all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Go ahead. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place. Uh huh. Until he come, come out. Come out. Go ahead. And have made an atonement for, for himself. himself and for his household 
and for all the congregation of Israel. Ain't that something? So ain't no man supposed to be in there because he, God, would will, have will killed him dead. Just like if you touched the Ark of the Covenant, he would have killed you for that. That was the priest's job. They were supposed to carry it by the staves and all that. What verse are you? Verse 18. Continue. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it. it. Uh -huh. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and, and of the blood, blood of the, of the goat, goat. Uh -huh. and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. Continue. And he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his finger seven, seven times, times. Go ahead. And cleanse it. See, the blood is a cleansing agent. The blood is a cleansing agent seven times and to do what? And hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Go ahead and read. And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place. So when he has made an end of recovering or cleansing the holy place, go ahead. And the tabernacle of the congregation. Go ahead. And the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Now he going to bring in this live goat. Remember, this live goat is the scapegoat. Go ahead and read. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat. Yes. And confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel. Go ahead. And all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head, head of the of goat. The goat. Uh -huh. And shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. So now he go, he go, he going to pray and he going to lay the sins on this live goat that he going to let go back into the wilderness. This is that goat. That went to, went, I mean, this is the represent the Lord Jesus when he went back to heaven. And all the sins of Israel and all the sins on the believers is on the head of the live goat, not the dead goat. If Jesus had not raised from the dead, you couldn't raise from the dead at the time appointed. The salvation was in, his, in the life, not in the death. Continue to read one more, verse 22. What does this say? And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited. See, that land represented heaven, and a land not inhabited. Go ahead. And he shall let go the goat uh -huh. in the wilderness. Yes, sir. He's going to let go that goat into the wilderness. Let's move on. Let's go to, uh, uh, let's go to Hebrews. Let's go to Hebrews, the seventh chapter. And we're going to pick it up at verse 1. Because he is your high priest. This is what the Lord is d doing for you. We don't have that many scriptures to go. This is what the Lord is doing for you. On the Day of Atonement, you're probably going to get almost the exact same lesson because this is a lesson that we all need to know and understand. Hebrews 7, he's going to pick it up at verse 1. Hebrews the 7 chapter, he's going to pick this up at verse 1. Hebrews 7, and we're going to pick this up at verse 1. Hebrews 7 and verse 1. Everybody got it? Go ahead and read. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God. Now he is the priest of the Most High God. Go ahead. Who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Yes. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation of king of righteousness. Yes. And after that, also king of Salem, uh -huh. which is the king, king of, peace. of peace. Go ahead. Without father, Go ahead. without mother, without descent. Remember, he inhabited eternity without father, without mother, without descent. Go ahead. Having neither beginning of days nor end of life. Go ahead. But made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. See, this is what the Lord is trying to show you. Skip to 14 and pick it up at verse 14. What does it say? Verse 14. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning, concerning the priesthood. priesthood. Go ahead. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest. Uh, and there arises another priest. Go ahead and read one more. Who is made not after the law of carnal, carnal commandment, uh -huh. but after the power of an endless, endless life. life. Verse 23. What does 23 say? And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. See, at one time, remember, Aaron died, didn't he? Mm -hmm. The Lord killed Aaron because of what he did when he made that gold calf. So he died. Go ahead and read. But this man. Talking about Jesus now. Go ahead. Because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. He got an unchangeable priesthood. Go ahead and read. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. Now you got to come through Jesus, but come unto God by him seeing what? 
seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. See, that's how you know he's sitting at the right hand of God making intercession for you. This is what he's doing. He is, that is his job. Verse 26, what does it say? For such an high priest became us who is holy, yes. harmless, yes. undefiled. Undefiled, go ahead. Separate from sinners go and ahead. made higher than the heavens. One more. Who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins. See, he wasn't like Aaron. He don't have to do that. Go ahead and read. And then for the people. Go ahead. For this he did once, once. when he offered up himself. Ain't that some? So he is showing you, he shows you the example of what he came to do. So now, by him sitting at the right hand of God, he ain't got to do all that stuff. You know, he don't have to do any sacrifices for his sin. I mean, uh, 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 make an atonement for his sin and for the sins of the people uh, uh, with animals, the blood, the bulls, and goats. Hebrews 9, turn over to the ninth chapter, and we're going to pick it up at verse 24. Hebrews 9 and 24. We're going to start there. Hebrews chapter 9. And we're going to pick it up at verse 24. And we're going to stay in Hebrews after this. And then we're going to back up to verse 8. We're going to read 9, 24 through 26. And then we're going to come back to verse 8. What does it say, brother? For Christ has not entered into holy places, into the holy places made with hands. Go ahead. Which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. See, that's what he's doing. He's interceding for you. He's, he's appearing in front of God for you. Go ahead and read. Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. See, every year Aaron could go behind the veil to make an atonement. Every year. This is an annual feast. Every year he could do that, but Jesus didn't have to do that. For neither that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered the holy place every year with the blood of others. One more. What does it say? For then must he often have suffered since the foundation, foundation of, of the, the world. world. Go ahead. But now once in the end of the world have he appeared to put away sin by, by the, the sacrifice, sacrifice of, of himself. himself. Y'all see that? He did it for you. He didn't do it for himself. He was sent because the creation had to be saved. Now check this out. This always jumped out at me. Verse 8. Now, the Holy Ghost, is, which is the word of God, is going to signify something to you. Check this out now, because salvation wasn't known when the tent of the tabernacle was standing. We didn't know nothing about how to get saved then. The book is going to say that. Verse 8, what does it say, brother? The Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. Look what that was not made manifest to you. Wasn't brought forth. Go ahead and read. While as the... While as the first, first tabernacle was yet, yet standing. standing. You see that? Go ahead and read. Which was a figure for the time then present. See, it was for that time. It was pointing to you to this time. Go ahead and read. In which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make, make him, him that did the service perfect. See, them animal sacrifices couldn't make you perfect. It was only put there as a forerunner to Jesus to come. You still had to, David and them still had to walk right. And they made uh, 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 mistakes back then, but the Lord can forgive you of your sins. You might kill somebody, and you, and you ask for forgiveness. You can be forgiven for that, but you still got to go to jail. You still got to pay that toll for what you did, but God might forgive you, but this man out here might not. See, that's, that's, that's the thing that you have to pay attention to. It's, it said that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to your conscience in your mind. Read on, brother, verse 10. What does it say? Which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse, diverse washings, washings uh -huh. and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. See, that animal sacrifice was imposed on you. It was forced on you if you believed enough and if you wanted to be forgiven for that sin. It was imposed on you until the Lord could come. Verse 11, what does it say? But Christ, being come in high priest of good things to, to come, come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, yes. that is to say, not, not of this, this building, building. Go ahead and read. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered into once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for, for us. Y'all see that? Having obtained. He has gotten it, the okay from the Father, and obtained eternal redemption for us. Verse 13, what does it say? 
For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the, the unclean, unclean uh huh, go ahead, sanctify to the purifying of the flesh. Now I gotta ask y'all something. Have y'all ever read Numbers 19? Does anybody in this room, including the brothers and sisters downstairs, including Bill, does anybody in this room have any water of purification at home, in their car, anywhere? Do you have any of that? Because if you do, you got to share it with us. <laughs> Y'all feel me? You, you, look, if, you, if, you went, if I went and buried, when I went and buried my mother and father, and I had to go to the cemetery. Now, under the old covenant, I had to have this water sprinkled on me on the third day. Then on the seventh day, I was clean. That's what the books say. But the books say if you don't have this water sprinkled on you, you are yet in your sin. Now, if y'all got some, don't hold out now. If you got some, you got to share it. But if you don't have that, then you guys... You know, that, that law cannot be kept. We don't deal with that law anymore. But it was representing if you are in the word and you die in Christ, the water of the word is sprinkled on you, you still can be saved. That makes sense? That, that is what this is all about. Now I'm going to read this. Stay, hold tight right there. I'm going to read verse 13. It says, whosoever touches the dead body of any man that is dead, I'm in, I'm in uh, Numbers 19 and 13, and purified not himself, defileth the tabernacle of the Lord, and that soul shall be cut off from Israel, because the water of separation was not sprinkled on him, he shall be unclean, he is yet in his unclean. In John 15 and 3, it says, you are clean by the water of the word. You are clean by the word. That's what cleanses you. If you sin and you ask for forgiveness, that, that cleanses you. See, we, we got to come and deal with this the way the books say that you're supposed to deal with this. Now, it talked about uh, uh, the tabernacle of the Lord. You are the tabernacle. Peter told you when this tabernacle dies, he's about to die and all of that. He just, he just used that. But verse 20 is say, If a man that shall be unclean and shall not purify himself, that soul shall be cut off from among the congregation. Why? Because he has defiled the sanctuary of the Lord. The water of separation has not been sprinkled upon him. He is unclean. So how? If you get unclean by reason of the dead, now how in the world can you become clean if you ain't got this water purification? You tell me. Because I don't know. I don't know how I can get you around that other than that water. And I can show you another lesson. That water represented the word. And this word is sprinkled on you and it cleanses you. I ain't talking about baptism now. I'm talking about the word of God that changed your life. The baptism is a process you do later to wash away your past sins, brothers and sisters. See, I try to meet you where you live at. I try to show it to you and, and, and keep it 100 with you. Because that's what the Lord showed me, and I've showed it to other brothers as well. This is, this is we are at the end game salvation didn't start, I mean, didn't come under the old covenant. It came, it's coming under the new covenant, and it's like a snowball rolling down a hill. It is coming. This is when salvation is coming. When Jesus comes, he said his reward is with him. Leviticus 16, Leviticus 16, brothers and sisters. Did you have one more? Yeah, you want me to read 14? Yeah, go ahead and read 14. Read 14. What else does it say? How much more shall the blood of Christ? Read, read 13 and 14 for him. And then we're going we gonna to move on to Leviticus 6, back to 16, and then we got one more after that. Verse 13 and 14, what does it say? For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkled the, sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the flesh. Now, if you had to do that and it sanctified you, go ahead and read. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit uh -huh. offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works? 
to serve the living God. He said, if you had to do that with the blood, with, with the ashes of a, of, the, of, the, of the red heifer and all of that, he said, how much more is the blood of Christ? How much better is that? He ain't talking about sprinkling no uh, uh, ashes or no heifer on you now. He's talking about you walking in newness of life, keeping the commandments. It's harder today to serve the Lord than it was yesterday because yesterday all you had to do is not do it. You can talk about killing somebody, but as long as you didn't do it, you wasn't in no trouble. But today, the Lord, the Lord knows that you dealing, he's dealing with his mind. If it come out your mouth, if you didn't thought it, you didn't already did it. And that is what he is all about here. He's trying to condition your mind. You know how you sisters put conditioning on your hair to make your hair better? And that's what this word is. It's a conditioner. It is trying to condition you. Le uh, Leviticus 16, and we're going to pick it up at verse 29, and then we're going to go back to Romans, and then we're going we're to end this, this feast of the Lord here. Leviticus chapter 16, and we're going to pick it up at verse 29. He's going to read 29 through, uh, through 32 for those that's taking notes. Leviticus 16, uh, 29 through 32. What does it say, brother? Leviticus 16. Verse 29. Jenkins, we, 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 we might have to make him walk back <laughs> to Chicago. Leviticus 16, 29 through 32. Al, you need a new son? Because I'm, I'm trying. 16, Leviticus 16, 29. What does it say, brother? And this shall be a statue forever unto you, that in the seventh month. In the seventh month. On the tenth day of the month. Yes. You shall afflict your soul. You shall afflict your soul. Go ahead. And do no work at all. Go ahead. Whether it be one of your own country. Uh -huh. Or a stranger that sojourneth among you. Yes. Now, y'all not see that? The strangers always have been a part of the church. The Lord just deal with Israel. Everybody in the church is called Israel. Everybody. Not just physical Israel. Spiritual Israel is called Israel because everybody got to be spiritual. Even the physical Israelite got to be a spiritual Israelite. Continue to read, brother. What does it say? For on that day, on shall, that the, day uh -huh. shall the priest make an atonement for you to yes. cleanse you. Yes. That you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. Ain't that something that you may be clean? Now, this is the day of atonement scripture. It says, make an atonement for you to cleanse you by that blood that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. Read on, brother. What does it say? It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you. Yes. And ye shall afflict your souls by a statue forever. It shall be a Sabbath of rest unto you, and you shall afflict your soul by a statue forever. One more. What does it say? And the priest whom ye whom he shall anoint, and whom he shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office in his father's stead. Ain't that something? Now, that's a big statement. Jesus is ministering in his father's stead. That is what the high priest is supposed to do. He is ministering in his, it says, and the, and the priest whom, shall, who, whom he shall anoint and whom he shall consecrate to minister in the priest's office in his father's stead. Go ahead and read shall make the atonement, and shall put on the linen clothes, even the holy garments. Because the priesthood back then under the old covenant had to come out of the sons of Aaron. They had, they had to come out of the sons of Aaron. Now, one last place. Let's go to Romans. Now, remember the two goats now. One was killed, and the other one was let go. Romans chapter 5, we're going to do 8 through 11. 8 through 11. Romans chapter 5. We're going to go 8 through 11. Again, back to the Father now, how he believed on us so that he sent his beloved son. Romans chapter 5. And we're going to pick this up at verse 8. Romans chapter 5. We're going to pick this up at verse 8, sisters and brothers. Verse 8. God always commended his love towards you. You're going to find out what justified you in the sight of, the, of God. Now you're going to realize why he told a woman, don't touch him. 
Because it is the blood that justifies you in the sight of God. He told you, when I see the blood, I will do what? Pass over you. See, all this is about saving you. Pick it up at verse 8, and let's close this out. Go ahead and read, brother. But God commended his love toward us. Yes. In that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Go ahead. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We shall be saved from wrath through him. Verse 10, what does it say? For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Now that's that first goat that they killed. He was, we were reconciled by the death of his son. That, that, that was that first goat, that first sin offering. Go ahead and read. Much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Didn't he, didn't he put all the sins on the head of the scapegoat? We read that, and we shall be saved by his life. Verse 11, what does it say? And not only so, yes. but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, uh -huh. by whom we have now received the atonement. This is what it's all about, brothers and sisters. You have received the atonement. Whether you know it or not, he came, he died, his blood was accepted as payment for you. He paid for you. So all you got to do is be grateful and just keep the commandments and try to live till he come. But if you die in the Lord, the Lord is still going to save you. Because the righteous dead is going to be raised in the first resurrection. And the righteous living is going to be changed in the first resurrection. And that's all at the sound of the seventh trumpet. Amen.